This morning I'm going to talk to you about joy. It's the third candle in the Advent wreath. It's the pink one. It's the shepherd's candle. And it's something that I've been, um, let's say, lacking for a couple of months. So let me talk first about what is the purpose of joy. Because our whole year is designed around purpose. So if we enter into Advent and we don't coincide the Advent calendar with purpose, then you know, we're missing what the Lord has given us as direction for the year. So I want to talk to you about the purpose of joy. And I'm going to suggest something that maybe you might not have thought about before, but I'm going to suggest to you that joy is the most effective weapon in our offensive arsenal when it comes to kingdom warfare. Most of us, myself included, think of joy as happy times. You know, we're happy, we're something great just happened, or we just got something we'd been wanting for a long time, or something happened, or God performed a miracle, or God provided, or God did something that changed our circumstances, and our response is joy. But I'm going to suggest to you that joy has to be ever-present regardless of our circumstances. Let me tell you what joy is not. Joy is not happiness. They are absolutely counter terms. Happiness and joy are not the same thing. Happiness is not dependent upon circumstances. Therefore, joy is, uh, joy is not dependent upon circumstances, whereas happiness is, and therefore joy is unconditional. It is unconditional. Joy is not false smiles that cover up, hide, deny, or ignore life situations. I can remember countless times walking into very, very serious situations where life circumstances were pretty overwhelming and we needed Jesus to intervene and walking in and saying, how are you doing? Expecting an answer and getting, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I know that. But how is your soul? Blessed. No, I know your spirit is blessed. How is your soul? Blessed. Blessed. I don't know if people think that that is spiritual or if people think that that makes them whatever, but God never tells us that we can't be honest with our pain or our struggle. Blessed is a condition ever present in our spirit. But has your soul ever been troubled? Yeah. Sometimes our soul is overwhelmingly troubled. And denying it only lets the enemy dig his teeth in deeper. But just saying, hey, my spirit is blessed and I am eternally held in the hands of God and my name is engraved in his palm but right now life is a little overwhelming for me. Would you pray for me? That's what community is all about. Community is not me faking you out and making you think I'm perfect and God answers me every day, all the time, on time, and I have everything I've ever desired and everything is perfect in my life. That's not that because what does that do to you when you struggle? It could, I'm not saying it does, but it could make you feel like God loves me more than he loves you. Now, I know God loves art more than he loves me. Or we'd be pastor in a little country church someplace. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Let's talk about what joy is. Joy is an offensive weapon in our arsenal against the enemy. Joy is our strength. 
Nehemiah 10 talks about that. And let me tell you the context under which this verse was written. It's, it's not just a, oh, the joy of the Lord is our strength, hallelujah, happy day. They had undergone a considerable length of time of oppression and trial and hard work. And they had compromised, they had lived in compromise, they had come back, they had built the walls, they had endured some compromise in their personal lives, and Nehemiah comes out with Ezra and he reads the law. And they are so overwhelmed by their sinfulness of what they should have been doing compared to what the law said, they began to weep. And Nehemiah says to them, no, 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 don't weep. The joy of the Lord is our strength. These promises, this law, this guides us. Just, just do it. Just stop compromising. Just do it. And accept and receive the joy of the Lord because it is our strength. Joy is the passion or emotion excited by the acquisition or expectation of good. I have joy when I sing songs like Jehovah Jireh, my provider, Jehovah Nisi, Lord you reign in victory. Jehovah Nisi means the Lord my banner. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord my peace. The Jehovah Rohi, the Lord my healer. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord my shepherd. Jehovah Sabot, captain of the host of the armies of the living God. Now if that doesn't excite you about the expectation of good, see me after the sermon. I'll give you a few more. If the enemy is coming against you, <clears throat> and he will, and he is, then you need to know, you need to stand on Jehovah Sabot, the captain of the host of the armies of the living God, which fights for you in the heavenly realm and defeats the enemy so that his temptations, his oppression, his whatever, cannot be manifest on earth. That is good news, people. That is the expectation of good. Lastly, joy is the pleasurable feeling or emotion caused by the rational prospect of possessing what we love or desire. And here's where joy gets very, very interesting. What do you desire? What do you really desire? Is it Jesus? Is Jesus what you really desire? Or is it your own way? Is it getting what you want? Is it a big house, a big car? Is it fame? Is it fortune? Is it fill in the blank? Because if Jesus is what we really, really want, then we should have immeasurable joy because we have the expectation of possessing him if we have invited him into our heart. If we have said yes to Jesus, if we have said, you know what? I recognize that I could never be good on my own. I can never make it with my own devices. I need Jesus. I need a savior who will cover me with his blood, who will forgive me from all the mistakes I make, great and small, and will stand me before God in total and complete propitiation, which just means justification. It's just a big old fancy word that means I don't have to stand before God on my own merit. I get to stand before God, just little old Sharon, covered in the blanket of the blood of Jesus. And Jesus' blood is what God sees, not Sharon's sinfulness and weakness and frail humanity. That is good news. That is joy. That lets me off the hook, right? That lets me off the hook. I don't have to run around trying to 
be good, trying to do what's right, trying to make sure that I've, I've whatever, whatever your context is that makes you think you can clean yourself up before God. I am no longer bound by that. I just stand. I just stand because I can. Because I stand firmly planted on the blood of Jesus, covered by him. And I now wear his righteousness and not my own sinfulness or frail humanity. We don't like the word sin in today's society. You know that, right? We don't like to be told that what we're doing is wrong. Have you ever confronted somebody under 30 and tried to explain to them that they were wrong about something? It's a formidable task, isn't it? Because we're right all the time. And all the time, we are right. <laughs> and if we're not right, then there's something wrong with you because you can't see that we're right. And let me tell you why I'm justified in doing what I'm doing. I don't care what God says. We don't have to play that game anymore. We don't have to play that game. So we can all stop and save ourselves a lot of energy that we could use to worship and praise. Right? We don't have to play that game anymore. So why is joy so important? Why, why is it important to us to have joy and to understand how we get joy? Joy is important because we're tired. How many of you are tired? Yeah. You're tired of work? Let me tell you something. How many of you are tired of doing laundry? Yeah, you know? Because let me tell you something about laundry. You wash all the clothes in the house and somebody changes clothes. I'll guarantee you, I'll guarantee you that the laundry basket in my house is not empty for longer than 47 seconds. 47 seconds. How many of you are tired of paying taxes? How many of you are tired of life circumstances which seem a little overwhelming? How many of you are tired of budgets that don't quite come together in the middle? We're tired. We're tired of ceaseless, ineffective, impotent activity trying to find peace and joy. And we're failing. We're failing big time. And not only are we failing, but those of us who are older are failing to live in such a way that the younger generation understands how to achieve peace and joy. Because we're just running around like a bunch of chickens with our head cut off, trying to keep that laundry basket empty for longer than 47 seconds. Trying to make ends meet. Trying to make it. Trying to fulfill our dreams. Trying to trying to chase our dreams, trying to, to get things to happen so that we feel like we're successful. Let me tell you that if we're ever going to embrace joy, we're going to have to understand that one of the enemy's chief strategies is to wear down the saints. There are probably... I'm going to just take a, a wild guess. At least 75% of the people in this room would not be tempted by what we would call a big temptation. I, I can't think of a man in this church who would cheat on his wife. I just, I just don't find it happening. I, I think a man in this church would say, oh, wow, you know, I see that temptation and I, I raise you 25 and I'm not calling, right? <clears throat> We're not going to gamble. We're not going to gamble with big sins. I don't think a lot of things, I don't think a lot of the big sins people in this church would do. 
But here's what I do know, is that we would compromise in a heartbeat on the little things because we're tired. Because we're just tired. And the enemy knows that, and the enemy wants to make us believe that we are smart, smarter, and so we do not follow the laws of God, and we follow the laws of our heart. And we confuse the two and think the laws of our heart are the laws of God, and most times they are not. How many of you have ever heard the, the phrase, God will never give you more than you can bear? How many of you think that's a scripture? I know it's a trick question, so you're not going to confess. But how many of you have ever quoted that to yourself in times of stress or trial? God will never give me more than I can bear. You, you want to know the truth of scripture? The truth of scripture is he will always give you more than you can bear because he wants you to be dependent upon him. If he wanted you to be independent, then that would be a verse in the Bible. And verses would read more like, use the brain I gave you. <laughs> Rather than come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. So oftentimes, we confuse what our grandma said or what we've heard and we assume that it's scripture because it's been quoted to us so much and it's actually the exact opposite of what God requires for us and we do it wholeheartedly and we miss joy. We miss joy because we're on a parallel track but we're not on the track. Satan robs us of joy on a daily basis. How many of you have ever woken up in the middle of the night in an absolute panic because of a circumstance that you didn't think you could handle? Okay, it happens to me a lot. In this season, it's happened to me a lot. I don't think I'm alone. I don't know how many of you will admit it, but I really don't think I'm alone. I'm not? Thank you. I think that the enemy knows that the time for Christ's return is coming close. Not going to give you a day. No, I don't think Trump's the Antichrist. No, I don't think, you know, no, I don't think Kim Jong Young is the Antichrist. No, I don't think we're going to the No, I don't think any of those things. But it's certainly closer than it was when the, the Word of God was written and recorded. And if you look at the times and the seasons and you measure them, certainly the return of Christ is much closer than it has been in my lifetime. The enemy will try to take out all of us that he can. And because we're real good at playing the Christian game and singing and praising and exciting our emotion, we'll fool ourselves into believing that we're firm followers of Christ when in fact, we're not. Because if we were, joy would be more abundant. Right? It's just logical. It, it's not rocket science. It's just logical. <clears throat> 1 Peter 5.8 says that Satan roars about like a roaring lion, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. The thing about roaring lions is they don't have any teeth, but they can scare the heck out of you. What happens when you're scared? You run. The direction you run determines whether you get eaten or not. Because see, <clears throat> the way lions catch prey is they put a roaring lion, an old lion with no teeth out in the, like in the clearing. And those are the majestic lions. You know, their mane, they don't look like the pictures. Their mane's all matted up, you know, because they live in the wild. They don't go to groomers. But 
they have these big majestic manes and they're they're gnarled and muscled and they're big and they're majestic and they sit out in that clearing and they roar and they fill the hearts of everything they're about to eat with absolute fear. So gazelles, antelope, unfortunate hunters, you know, whatever. They run for cover. They run right into the bushes where the smart lions have set a little trap with all the young lions who do have teeth. And they attack you and they chew you to death. And then the reward for the old lion is after their saliva has entered into whatever they're killing, you know, antelope burgers or, you know, zebra toast or whatever. And the young lion's saliva has partially digested the meat. The old lion gets to come and pick the bones because he doesn't have teeth to pull it off himself. He can only eat what's partially digested. The enemy literally has no power over you. And once you realize that, once you grasp that, and you begin to run toward the roar, you will be filled with immeasurable joy and no more panic. Now the enemy is not going to let you come to that conclusion easily. He's going to give you things that are absolutely overwhelming. He's going to give you every reason, every logical reason to compromise what you know is the commands and the laws of God. Every reason. He's going to give you every reason to do it and you're going to feel justified. You're going to feel so incredibly smart in doing it and hey, if you're not smart and you do make a mistake, what's our fail safe? Oh, there's forgiveness for that. Right? Why worry about forgiveness when you can just do what's right in the first place? See my point? Yeah, he forgives you. The forgiveness is the fail safe, but let's live so we don't need it. Right? Okay, you don't have to say amen to that. Luke 8 is the parable of the sower. And just so you know, you're going to hear more scriptures from me, Aiken Art, than you've heard in any of my last five sermons. So buckle your seatbelt. Just buckle up. Buckle up, okay? Luke 8 is the parable of the sower, of the seed. There are two seeds that the enemy loves. One seed springs up. In fact, let's just read it because it's, you know, my rendition of it is not near as exciting as the actual word itself. Luke 8. Let's start in verse... No, let's start in verse 11. Thanks, though. Always appreciate your help during any of my sermons. Verse 11 is the explanation of the parable. <clears throat> it says, this is the meaning of the parable. The seed is God's word. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message only to have the devil come and take it away from their hearts and prevent them from believing and being saved. There are some people, I don't know why, whose hearts are just hardened to the gospel. They, they don't want to get saved. I don't know if it's self-sufficiency. I, I don't know what it is. I wish I did because if I did, I would just work real hard to cancel it so everyone could be saved and come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ, but I can't. There are some people who just don't want to be saved. They want to play the spiritual game. They want to come. They want to sit in church. They don't really obey God's word. They just come and sit in church and they like to sing and they like to feel good and they like if the church can help them now and then, but they're not really interested in orchestrating their life around the biblical principles that are required 
for a son or a daughter of God. Now, here's the sad thing about that. You don't embrace the responsibility. You don't get the privilege. So your life is always a day late and a dollar short and you're always wondering why God isn't there and the reason God isn't there is because you have not fully embraced and received him as Lord and Savior and you're not willing to lay down what you want and what you think and what you think you have for what he has for you in this hand. Because you're holding so tightly to the meager little nonsense that you do have that you won't just put it down and trust God. And for me, that's one of the saddest things that I've ever seen in the 61 years that I've lived. Continuing. The, seed, the seeds on the rocky soil represent those who hear the message and receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they believe for a little while, and then they fall away when they face temptation. That's the people who put their Bible on the shelf and dust it off once a year when they come to church on Christmas and maybe on Easter. You don't read it. You don't believe it. You don't eat it like nutritious food. You just put it up there and on a day when you're feeling bad, you say, um, let me click the little, um, let me click the little magnifying glass on my app and put in Today I'm sad and see what pops up and I'll read that. No, that's not how you use the word. You use the word from Genesis to Revelation. You use it in historical context. You use it in doctrinal context. You use it in context. You cannot pull out a verse and just poof. It's not magic, people. It's not magic. It's the word of God. Let me give you an example. You're thumbing through the Bible. You get to the little verse that says Judas went out and hung himself. Then you flip over a couple pages and it says go therefore and do likewise. <laughs> Anybody here think that's wisdom from God Almighty? No, it's not. No. That's what happens when you just pick and choose what you want. Now, if we're talking about this as a meal, then anyone who's ever had a kid in your house, you know exactly what I'm talking about. They pick what they want off their plate. What 14-year-old girl says, I'd like broccoli and, um, you know, I'd have some collard greens and, oh no, please don't give me mac and cheese because, you know, way too much fat and... What do they eat? Pizza. Pasta, mac and cheese. They eat that stuff because they love it, right? And they could eat it every day. I know some people who could eat the same thing every day. Every day they could eat the same thing. Same thing applies to people who church hop. Now you can either physically church hop or you can radio church hop. You know what happens when you church hop? You get dessert every meal. Because you pick and choose what you will listen to and what you won't listen to. And how joyful are you at the end of that? Oh, you're happy for a minute because it tickles your ears. And there, you're probably even going to find some solid word in there someplace. But tell me what nutritionist is going to tell you it's okay to eat dessert every day, every meal. It's not healthy. And neither is not taking this word and dissecting it and eating it and knowing what it says we can do and what it says we can't do and what it says we should do and what it says we must do to be sons and daughters of God and claim his inheritance. So how do we utilize this weapon of joy? We, we've already heard what it is, what it isn't. We already know the enemy tries to rob it from us. We already know that it, our seeds can either, you know, be in the thorns or, or they can just fall on the wayside. You know, we have to have roots. We have to have depth. Well, Ephesians 6 is the best scripture I know, 10 through 18, on, on the armor of God. It's the best scripture that there is. It's 
It's premier. So we know, we put on the, the breastplate of righteousness. Okay, that's Jesus' righteousness, which we wear. We attach that breastplate of righteousness to the belt of truth. What does Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. Right? So we attach the breastplate of his righteousness onto Jesus himself. Then we shod our feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, which means every go, we, everywhere we go, we talk about the peace that we have achieved through Christ. Then we put on the helmet of salvation, which covers our mind and our head with the blood of Christ. And then the scripture, I have the mind of Christ, now that's where that starts coming into play. Then we take up the sword of the spirit, and which is the word of God and the shield of faith. Now that's all great and those are all defensive weapons. They all prevent us from being attacked. Offensively though is the helmet of salvation. It serves both an offensive and a defensive purpose. Defensive because if you have it on nobody's going to sling one of those What's that called? Mace. A mace. No one's going to swing a mace and knock you in the head. But offensively, if you use the blood of Jesus as your mind transformation tool, then it becomes an offensive weapon. Uh, Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. It takes out trying to figure it out by ourselves. Deuteronomy 6, 5 says, Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Those things, your heart, your soul, your strength, your imagination, your dreams, all those things make up the realm of the soul. And if you cannot lay your dreams, your aspirations, your hopes before the Lord and release them, and take what he gives you back, then you will contend with the Lord all your days trying to win over what you want as opposed to what the Lord wants for you. Doesn't mean don't dream. Doesn't mean don't pursue. But it does mean ask first. Because we waste a lot of energy and a lot of time Pursuing things that the Lord never intended for us to pursue and if we would have asked rather, in, rather than running headlong into something that we wanted, we would have known that and we would have already been successful. Later on in Deuteronomy 8, the word says, remember the Lord your God. It is he who gives you the power to create wealth. The, or the power to be successful, the ability to create wealth. And he does this to fulfill a covenant that he made with your ancestors. It is your covenantal promise as a child of God to have the ability to create wealth and the power to be successful if and only if you remember the Lord your God. Psalms 37, 4, if I can have the next slide. Says, trust in the Lord and do good. Then you will live safely in the land and prosper. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desires. Let me tell you something. When I align my heart's desires with what the Lord wants for me, I am successful. When I have heart's desires that are not aligned with what the Lord wants for me, 
Then I rub against his will, and I have contention, and I have strife, and I have frustration, and I'm, I'm just, I'm not joyful. Joy comes with surrender to the will of the Lord. Matthew 6.33 says, don't worry about things. What will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. If you're worrying about these things, you're, you're on the same plane as a non-believer. These things dominate the world, but your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. This is Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Jireh means the Lord who knew your need before you knew it and already provided for it. How cool is that? So when I go to the Lord for things I need, I can either go in frustration, which happens to me often. I'm not preaching this out of a point of 100% victory, okay? Don't, don't buy into that. Don't let the enemy lie to you. I go to the Lord frustrated all the time. I sit down in my office, banging my head against the desk, crying all the time for things that are necessary for us to accomplish what the Lord wants us to accomplish here. But, but when I go to the Lord, I can either go and say, oh, Jesus, please, please, please. Or I can say, Lord, I am not a beggar. I am a son of God. And your word says that the children of God will never be found begging for bread. Never be found begging for bread. So I come to you as Jehovah Jireh. Lord, before the foundations of the world, you knew the need I would have today, and you have provided for it. Open my eyes to see where the ram is hiding in the thicket. Show me where. Show me where. In closing, I'm just going to give you a couple practical things. First of all, you have got to settle the question. I, I can't, I, I wish I could make it pretty. I, I really do. I wish I could sit here and tell you that you're justified in all the things that you put before the Lord. But you're not, and neither am I. And I'm going to tell you something real practical. I know that my best option to get devotions done in the morning is to get up and be at the office before 5 o'clock and have all my devotions done before any of my staff members get here. Because once, once 7 o'clock happens and those parents start bringing those little kids in and the teachers come in and somebody calls off and we have to rearrange the schedule and somebody gets a bloody nose and somebody else needs a nebulizer treatment and on and on and on and on and on, I am not getting to my devotions. And I love Jesus with all my heart. I love him with all my heart. I've served him for, oh my gosh, whatever, I, since I've been nine. So whatever 61 minus nine is, 52 years. I've served God for 52 years, never took a back seat, never decided a day that I wasn't going to serve God since I was nine years old. But let me, let me explain something. When that man's sitting right there, your pastor, when he rolls over, at 4.30 in the morning, and he wraps his arm around me, Jesus takes a back seat. Yeah, that's just honest. And when he just snuggles up to me and pulls me close, I start trying to not let him think that I'm distracted, but I start praying in my mind, God, I don't think I'm going to get devotions done today. Could you make a way? Could you please make a way for me to get devotions done today? Because I'm pretty sure I'm going to be laying here until 6.30 when he gets out of the bed. Does he mean to do that? Oh, I sure hope not. <laughs> I sure hope you're not sabotaging me. But life sometimes sabotages us. And that's a funny example, but sometimes we put family ahead of God. Sometimes we put work ahead of God. Sometimes we put all kinds of things ahead of God. So settle the question. Is it Jesus only or is it Jesus and? If it's Jesus and, then knock it off. Just, I love you. 
You have no idea the depth of love that I have for you people and how sad I will be if all the fullness of what God has planned for you is not given to you on earth and reaped by you in heaven. You have no idea the tears I shed for you so that the fullness of God is manifest in you. So if it's Jesus and, then please knock it off. It's not worth it. You're not that smart. You're not that good. You're not that valuable. Get to church. Get to service. Get to giving your gifts in the kingdom. Get in this community and be a part. It's not Jesus and astrology. It's not Jesus and you know, let me tell you something, all those nice little quotes and all those cute little memes that people give, no power, no power. It might make you feel happy for a minute, might be cute to post on Facebook, you might get a lot of likes, but there is no power in memes. There is power only in this. Power only in this. There's no power in those quippy little quotes that you give to each other. No power, this is it. This is it. The one, the only, Jesus Christ and him only. Know the word. You've got to know this. You've got to know this for more than just leafing through and open it up and going. Uh, the trumpet calls Israel's army to mobilize, but no one listens. Okay, that was good. I'll journal that tomorrow. Now got to know the word. Okay, last, you got to quote the word. You got to know the promises. There's 3,563 promises for you in the word of God. So I don't know all your personal circumstances, but I'll guarantee you out of 3,500, and I think it's 23. 3,500 is right. 23, I, I may have forgotten. 3,500 plus scriptures, trust me, you got a problem? There's a promise for it. There's a promise for it. Don't you, don't you say God didn't cover it. I don't care if it is 2017 and you are under 29. This book is as current for you as it is for me at 61 years of age. So don't let the enemy lie to you and say God can't understand you because you're young, you're a millennial. Okay, quote the word. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. Not all that I want. All that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. Go on to the next scripture. You can read these for yourselves. Psalms 91. I quote this every day. I quote this every day over my family and over each one of you. I quote this in my, in my prayers. Sometimes even when I'm snuggling with that cute guy down there. If I can have the next scripture. Psalm 91. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. Uh, he alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God and I trust him. I will cover, he will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. You don't have to be afraid of the terrors of the night. You don't have to be afraid of the arrows that, have, that have fly through the day. Next scripture. Hebrews 13, 5. Next one. Psalms 91 was really long. Two slides. Don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have. For God has said, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. How many of you knew that passage had to do with money? That's a money passage. Matthew 6.33, we already did this. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. Luke 12.29.31 And don't be concerned about what to eat or drink. Don't worry about such things. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers all over the world. But your father already knows your needs. Next slide. Seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. If you think you are standing strong, be careful not to fall. The temptations in your life are no different from what others are experiencing. And God is faithful. 
He will allow the temptations, he will not allow the temptations to be more than you can stand. That's where that verse comes in. That's the misquotation. He will not allow your temptations to be more than you can stand, but he will always give you more than you can bear so that you will be dependent upon him. See the difference? See how the enemy twisted that to make us independent rather than dependent? When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. So when you're tempted, what's the prayer? Open my eyes. Show me the way. Show me the way out. 1 Corinthians 7, 1, uh, 1, 7 through 9. Now you have every spiritual gift you need as you eagerly await for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be free from all blame on the, Lord when, on the day when our Lord Jesus Christ returns. God will do this because he's faithful to what he says. And he has invited you into partnership with his son Jesus Christ. 2 Thessalonians 3.3, 3, but the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen you and guard you from the evil one. And the last one. Here's the Psalms. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Praise the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Who can list the glorious miracles of the Lord? Who can pray, ever praise him enough? There is joy for those who deal justly with others and always do what is right. And the last verse as I close is Psalms uh, 136. I'm not going to take the time to read this, but this is often done as a responsive reading. And it details everything that the children of Israel went through. And it says, it starts like this, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of Lords. His faithful love endures forever. If you go on down, it says, Give thanks to him who parted the Red Sea. His faithful love endures forever. So as I close, I'm going to challenge you to increase your joy and do one practical thing for me. Write your own Psalms 136. Write your own Psalms 136. My Psalms 136 would include praise the Lord for the security grant that we received. His faithful love endures forever. Praise the Lord for me not dying of cancer in 2011. His faithful love endures forever. Praise the Lord for him restoring me and holding me when I almost died on September 8, 2011. His faithful love endures forever. Write your own Psalm 136 and say it to yourself every day until you are so filled with praise and gratitude. You are so filled with what God has done for you that what he has to do for you out of his, your dependence upon him will not even be a question. It will just be, Lord, I will wait until it comes because you are faithful. Because your faithful love endures forever. And then together as a community, together as a congregation, we will sing. The joy of the Lord is my strength. 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 Amen.